right. You guys like lunch? So we do a little something then. When I say Kogi, you say Por Vida. Kogi. Kogi. That's what's up, man. Um, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, that was my heart. That was my life. Big love to my team. That's what we do on the streets. Um, but I'm here to talk about something else. Forgive me. My mind is still in cook mode, so I'm going to use my phone a little bit. But um, I'm here to talk about local. And uh, what local is, is really, let me first get into this. Uh, I stood on this stage last year, and I poured out my guts to everyone here. Um, and really, there was no plan. Uh, I just wanted to put up a mirror so that we as chefs could all look at it and just kind of like take a litmus test and see what's up. Um, and then this guy called me, Daniel Patterson, DP. You, you know, we, uh, we chopped it up a little bit and then things really just clicked. Uh, and then we just went to work, you know, like us cooks do. And so I'll say it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna tackle the fast food industry, okay? And we're gonna start in America. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna build a concept that really, you know, it has, that will have the ideology and, you know, the heart and the ideology and the science of a chef, but it'll have the relevance of, you know, McDonald's or Burger King, you know, out there in the neighborhoods, in the streets. Um, we're going to go toe to toe, you know, and not really in a like in a confrontational way, but we're going to go toe to toe to try to see um, how we can challenge the status quo of, fa of fast food. So, you know, in a way, it kind of feels too big, right? It's like it's this huge cloud, and it's like how do you tackle it? Um, you know, in many ways, we as a community we raise the white flag, and we think that this is how food is going to be forever. Fast food, junk food, institutional food, commodities, corporations, GMO, school food, cheap, 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 you know, uh, nasty food, but addicting, you know. Um, so really, like, where do you start? That was the big question. Where do you start? How do you start? And does the world even need us to start? Then I was like, fuck it, man. You just start, you know. <laughs> um, so... So this is, this is how we're going to start. Uh, this is the concept a little bit in its mood board form and kind of uh, uh, in its feel. So I'm going to click through some images. You can see this be these beautiful, uh, really, you know, especially here in Europe, you guys have the piazzas and the plazas and the big, big centers in town where everyone can in the summertime go out. There's something about in the streets, in, L in America we have curbs. <laughs> we have curbs and street corners, but there's something beautiful about eating outside and what that does and how that evokes your appetite. So really, these images of the asphalt, of colors, of fruits, uh, bringing the outdoor and the indoor in. Coming here for the first time last year, I was really inspired by Danish design and ergonomics and furniture design and just the, the way this country approaches uh, design, but for the everyday life, but also thinking high-minded. So, you know, why can't a fast food place be that way as well, was our thinking. So incorporating woods and concretes, uh, incorporating uh, creative seating areas, you know, looking at things like this where a big, a big part of fast food in America is really trapping the, the young kid. And so, you know, using all the tricks of the trade, creating an area where instead of fluorescent lighting and boxed in seating, everything is a flow and everything is a playground. So you can sit anywhere you want, you can climb anywhere you want. The whole place flows in a rhythm and we treat it just like a restaurant with an open kitchen, um, there's, no, there's no barrier between what's being cooked and who's ordering the food. Skateboard parks, especially in Los Angeles, it's a, it's a huge culture. And for, for me, just 
the rhythm and, and again, the, the flow of it, the, the smoothness, being able to sit anywhere, maybe creatively create something out of whatever is there and create something that wasn't supposed to be, but then it becomes something else. Um, you had something along with the Kogi Taco, which is the first beta prototype of our, our Smash. So um, the, way, the biggest thing, though, is how, you know, there are gourmet burger stands out there and gourmet fast food, but still the price point is anywhere from five to nine dollars. Um, you know, that doesn't seem like a huge deal, but that is, there, there's a huge valley in a, between two dollars, 99 cents, and six dollars even. And so the, the idea, really the, the, the core of the idea is how do we get the food to be 99 cents and sit right next to a Popeye, sit right next to a, a churches or a KFC, be in the neighborhood. Um, we can't do it by providing just all meat, you know, and protein. So what we, that's where the chef mind comes in. And that's where Daniel really, you know, where he really inspired me is we, we cut the meat with grains, um, but we, may, we, but you never get the feel of the fact that the burger is not 100% meat. Because we're not big enough yet to buy futures in meat and buy futures in, in the commodity. So the only way we can go about it is by using science. Um, and then you have just a feeling right there. That's, that's just a feeling of what we want to evoke in local. You know, we didn't eat like you see now in the world, right? Like just two generations ago, probably many of your parents or even grandparents. Um, but now this is who we've become. We've been brainwashed and our whole diet has been washed and polluted. But I feel like we could change it. I mean, I said it last year, but I didn't know I was gonna be standing on this stage this year. I told you five years, I was gonna come back mad eight, but like, I'm here mad four. <laughs> but like, you know, we can change it. Now, in two, it took like two generations ago we weren't there, but, and then now we're here. But I feel like we can change it in two generations from now. You know, really just took this, this one generation to change our whole eating habit. And, um, you know, so while we're physically here, all of us, while we're physically in this form, in this skin, in this body, we can make a change for generations that aren't here physically yet. So then that way everything shifts. Um, you know, and we can eat more like, like animals, you know, like not the animals we become, but like how animals really eat. And um, so one of my metaphors is like, you wouldn't have record execs making the music, right? Like you, that's what musicians do. So right now we're in a situation where we have, we don't have the cooks designing the food for the masses in, what, in which most people are eating. So, um, you know, this, this really, this presentation is about let's get the chefs, us, to make the food and the moral choices for the people and let the suits do what they're good at, you know, and it'll become a symbiosis, just like front of the house and back of the house, you know what I mean? So it's time to shift, and we do it like we know how as chefs. We just get in and cook, and this is DP right here. First of all, Team Kogi, come on. And, and, a, and a huge thank you to Team Noma and Team Momofuku, please. If, just in case you're curious, if Team Noma can throw down on burgers, yes, yes, they did. Um, so, I guess, uh, I guess the idea for Local started uh, a few years ago. Um, started a, a charity foundation called The Cooking Project, and, and um, it was about teaching young kids uh, how to cook, but, but, but not cook for a restaurant, how they could make nutritious food at home instead of going to a fast food place. And it was really interesting. I learned two things. One is that there's this kind of myth that there's a certain sector of, of American society that really wants garbage. But, but it's actually not true, you know? No matter how people grew up, if you give them delicious food, they choose delicious food. And I think there's a, there's, there's a myth about the choice that's given. You know, we're actually not giving that choice to everyone. And then the other thing is, 
We don't have a cooking problem in America. We have an eating problem. You know, we have no taste memory of real food anymore. But it took one generation to lose it, like Roy said, and I think we could take one generation to get it back. So, Emma K. Fisher once said, or she wrote, uh, one cannot uh, think well, uh, uh, love well, or, or sleep well unless one has dined well. You know, I think you can survive on bad food, but it's not much of a life. You know, access to nutritious food is a fundamental right. You know, it's one that a lot of Americans don't enjoy. So, so part of the problem is, so Roy was up here last year, and he talked about hunger, how too many people in America fall at or below the poverty line, and they can't afford enough to eat. But, but there's this other problem, which is that most of the country which can afford enough to eat are choosing to eat processed food. You know, like Roy is saying, you know, most of our country is fed by corporations, not chefs, you know? So, so the question is, like, what can a chef do about it, you know? How can a chef create change? Well, you know, Roy and I are going to, like he said, we're going to open a fast food restaurant, you know? And, and a lot of them. So we're going to open two, one in San Francisco next spring, and then a few months later in L.A., and then you're after that, like, like a million? Yeah? Um, I mean, you know, you think about it like, as a chef, right? No one has actually gone into the fast food sector, and I'm saying fast food, and I'm not saying like, like fast food plus, you know, there's a lot of those kind of places that, like Roy said, they're, they're, they're cheap to most people, but to a lot of the country, they're not cheap, they're expensive, you know? So how, how do we do that? Well, we're cooks, you know? There's not only um, grains in the, in, the, in the burger, there's also uh, tofu, seaweed, garum, Beef garum, too. Thank you very much, Lars from Noma, for that. That was a great idea. Um, you know, we think, and this is, this is not a charity. This is a for-profit business. So we think that if we can create something that can make money serving real food at a low price point, you know, we can do this other thing where people say, you know, the fast food places, it's all we can do for that price. It's all we can do. I don't think so. I think we can start from the ground up and, re and, and kind of reinvent it. But if you think about it, it's only, it's only one part of institutional eating in America. There's also schools, hospitals, prisons. I mean, think about prisons. Like, we're trying to rehabilitate people, and we're feeding them food that most people wouldn't feed a dog, you know? Hospitals, like, you think about cooking with love for someone who's, who's sick, you know? And then you think about hospital food. I mean, hospital food is like a benchmark of disgustingness. You know, someone puts up a plate of food and, and the chef says, oh, it looks like hospital food. You know, that is not a compliment, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then kids are like, you know, everyone's concerned because, because the kids in America are falling behind other industrial nations. They don't know why. It's like, I don't know. Take your car and put, put garbage in it and see how well it runs, you know? I mean, we're feeding them crap and then we're expecting them, their brains to move at the highest level. It, it just doesn't work like that. It makes no sense, you know? So, this is, um, this is exactly the moment where I lose my train of thought. Um, so, so, anyway, we, we have this idea, and, um, and, and if I was really smart, I would have brought my notes on. Well, I'll talk on. about local. The name local, and um, it's two concepts together. Local, like we're fucking crazy to be doing this. You know, everyone's going to be like, what is this? Like, you're crazy. And then local. You know, we're local. And so uh, that became local. Yeah, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, that one just came, yeah, I smoke a lot of weed, just, man. <laughs> so, like, the word just like, it looked right. <laughs> you know, we have a good partnership. Like, yeah. Roy does all of the, the front stuff, the smart stuff. I just stay behind and, and just watch all of the names. Say, Awesome job. Um, you know, one, one thing though, like we're talking about all these things and there's a lot of chefs in the audience and one of the things we're not saying is that, is that chefs aren't doing enough. I mean, chefs have the biggest hearts of anyone I know. You do more to donate their, their time, energy, resources than almost any other sector I can think of, than any other sector I can think of. But I wonder sometimes if we couldn't use our efforts a little more effectively, like, I wonder about like this thing where we have charity dinners and, and all the chefs in the audience, you know what I'm talking about. You show up, you make a thousand pieces of something for a reception, you make a, 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 a plate for 400 people and... Crab canopy. <laughs> the crab canopy. But you know, it's like, it is the 
the least efficient way of raising money that I can think of. Why not just write a fucking check, let the charity do its job? You know, instead you're making the charity become a hospitality organization. They're not a hospitality organization, so what you get at the end is much less than what people pay. But, but that's not what I was thinking about. What I was thinking about is the really funny thing, which is that, you know, chefs are there like, we're the entertainment, you know? We're the band, we're the reason that people come, but, but let's just say the, the charity is like trying to solve hunger. I mean, we're the experts. It's like, it's what we do, we feed people. I don't know, maybe they should ask us. I mean, maybe we'd have some ideas, you know? I mean, like maybe we should have the board of directors instead of in the reception line. I just think that, you know, maybe chefs have a little bit more to offer than putting a piece of crab on a crouton, so. I mean, I mean, so we, t like I talked about the other, institutional eating in our country, like, who else is going to actually do the work to recreate an entire system? And I don't mean just take something that's already there and make it a little bit better, but fundamentally break it down and rebuild it in a way that we can, we can feed people real, nutritious food, you know? I mean, who else has the drive, the intensity, the, the, the skill, the experience? Who else is going to care as much as a chef? You know, it's not a teacher, not a doctor. I mean, they have other jobs to do, you know? It's not gonna be our government. I mean, they've shown that, you know? But there's, there's something else that we have that other people don't have. And that's we have each other, you know? Um, I couldn't do this without Roy. He couldn't do it without me. You know, and then, so we're talking and I'm thinking, um, I really wanna have like a bun, long fermented, whole grain. How can we do something that seems like a fast food bun, but actually has some nutritious value? So I called Chad. Tartine Bakery in San Francisco. Um, and so he made the buns, the recipe. I, I actually made the buns with Louise from uh, Noma, so if there's any uh, problem with them, that would be my fault and not Chad's. Um, but it's 20% koji rice, you know? It's, it's like, it's this really interesting, delicious thing with perceptual sweetness that you only get if you know how to cook, you know? So, okay, let's show of hands. A lot of chefs in the audience tonight. Like, what if uh, Renee, Alex, Dave Chang, Alice Waters, they call you up and they say, uh, I have this idea that we can change how people eat in schools, so we can feed everyone in the entire country nutritious food, but, but I need your help. How many people say yes? Yeah, so look around. It's everybody, you know? And that's what we have that no one else has, you know? And there's, there's something else too. Um, I'm sorry. Don't mind me. <laughs> that wasn't his water. <laughs> That's the crazy we're, thing. We're a very sharing place. I'll get you a new one, I promise. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> um, you know, the, the idea of of this kind of cooperation, you know, this sharing of ideas and values. I mean, this is what Matt is all about. This is why Renee started it. This is why I come every year. And this is how Roy and I met, you know? It's really important. So, I mean, I think there's one other thing that's really important, and that's that we spend a lot of time learning how to cook. Like, years and years, or in my case, decades, unfortunately, it's kind of grown to. And sometimes people say, you know, chefs should stay in the kitchen as if it's like the feudal system still, and we're the servants. But I do agree for young cooks, you know? I think you should keep their head down, keep their mouth shut, stay off of the fucking Instagram and learn their craft, you know? But, <laughs> but if, if you work hard over time, if you're lucky, you develop some skill and some experience, and then every once in a while, you can step out of your kitchen like this and maybe do something more. So anyway, I asked a question. And what can a chef do to create change? But I think it's the wrong question, you know? I think the question is, what can all of us chefs do together? I think the answer is a lot. <laughs>